Hi, my name is Mitra Manesh. I'm a servant. I serve through teaching, coaching, consulting, or any other way that I can find to share what I know with those who want to know. And this Lights On podcast is one of those ways. It was created with consciousness and mindful living in heart. So join us as we travel through many roads of learning and transformation together. And if you enjoy our podcast, please give us feedback by rating us five star and share us with others if you think they may benefit from it. On behalf of my team, I thank you for your presence. This episode is a coaching episode. Uh, Every now and then I have a volunteer that I don't know uh, and they would like to be coached on a topic that I have no idea what it is, which allows us both, the coach and the coachee, to become present and be in the moment. Uh, This particular young woman brings up uh, a very interesting and common topic of inability to ask for help. You see, We are quite encouraged and praised if we are independent and we never need help and if we can take care of all of our issues, which is fine, especially for people around us, but in, in its essence, it goes against life because we are all, first of all, interconnected and the essence of life, which is breathing, tells us the, the law of life and that is to breathe in and to breathe out, to take in and to give out. So the balanced way of living is to give and to receive. And if we are only giving or if we are only receiving, we are really um, bringing a sense of imbalance to the nature of our existence. So let's uh, take a nice drink and sit down together and go on this journey of unfolding Elisa and her issue in life. I hope you enjoy it as much as we enjoyed chatting. Let's take a listen together. Hi, everyone. This is another one of our um, coaching podcast sessions. They're very exciting, hard to arrange, but very, very exciting when it takes place. So I am here with Elisa, who's an artist, and she's going to tell us more about uh, where she's from and and share with us what area of her life she would like us to, or she would like me to um, guide her through and do some mindful attentionist coaching. As you know, I'm, I'm preparing, uh, I mean, I don't know when we will go live with this podcast, but uh, I have developed a whole training around uh, grooming other coaches. And I'm very excited about um, doing these sessions uh, publicly as uh, it may be helpful to those who may uh, identify with the uh, issues and things that are discussed and to those who are professional coaches and they may pick a, a, a sort of something from this and I hope that it's helpful and I hope that it serves you no matter why you're listening to our podcast. So hello Elisa and welcome to our session. Hi Mitra, thank you, thank you for, for making time. <laughs> Of course. No, I'm really excited. So tell us, uh, if you would, uh, where are you from and um, what do you do? Okay. So, uh, well, as you said, I'm an artist. Uh, I'm originally from Venezuela, but I live in in another country right now, as many Venezuelans nowadays. Um, I guess that I could just, like, the reason why I'm talking to you right now is that I recently realized like a few months ago I realized that I kind of and it's funny because this is exactly what I should be doing like I realized I need help asking for help like it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's something that I, I I've noticed it's, it's kind of really hard for me and I guess the first time I noticed that was uh last year I think around I don't know October November or something at that point I I really needed 
help from my then boyfriend uh, for something else. Like, I mean, he's always helped me with things. And, and, and at that point, I, I remember like, I needed his help with something. And I really wanted to be able to say, like, I really need your help with this. Can you help me? And I noticed that I couldn't. Like, I couldn't just say those words. Like, I immediately couldn't say them. And I was just like, if this is too annoying or if I'm asking for too much, just let me know and I'll figure something out. And that was the moment when I realized, why can't I just say, you know, like I need help or, or anything. Um, and ever since I've been like kind of working with that or kind of trying to figure out why it's so hard. And um, I'm, I also like go to therapy. So there's other things that I've noticed that are also hard for me that basically everything is kind of related to that, to that same question. So I guess the, the reason why I'm here is that I kind of want to know like how to do that without feeling like I'm being like an inconvenience for people when I ask for help. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Thank you. So like any other issue or, or any other, um, I, I call them like little points of attention in life that we need to look at. We can look at it from three perspectives. We can look at it from physical aspect. I can tell you, oh, of course you went through this and you're sitting here and you don't have this and, and you're far from this. So from the physical aspect of your life, I can look at that with you. Or we can look at it psychologically and you said that you've you know, been in therapy or you have had some therapy. So that's the psychological aspect that one can look at from, which is probably, you know, what was your position in the family, siblings, what was your role, Where, how were your parents showing up, were they responsible enough, were they absent, were they present, so those are the um, psychological aspect that is not my expertise, so I'm just uh, identifying them, but I'm not going to go there, but from energetic, meaning from a much, much bigger perspective of life, um, I'm going to take you there and see if that resonates with you. From that perspective, when we do not ask for help, or if we ask for help too often, you see that one is um, recognized and, and identified uh, that we're in victim mode, everybody says that. But really the other extreme also is a, a challenge and it's something that needs to be looked at. We do not, um, and I don't know if you're familiar with my work, but I look at things very much from the survivalist or non-survivalist perspective. In fact, I'm working on a book on that subject, that when we are in survival mode, we do not trust that another person can help us. Or the other extreme of it is, we do not trust that we are worthy of being helped, right? But it is really because I'm in survival mode, even though I may look like, you know, I put myself together, I have a home, I have a good job. Survival mode is not necessarily about like just money. It's about the state of being. So when I am in that state, just imagine, like I'm running from some danger. I'm not going to stop and say, Elisa, could you please help me with this? Right? Or if I'm really desperate, I may stop and, and beg you and cry, please help me. I don't know what to do. These are the two extremes of being in the state of survivalist or survivalism. Um, so I believe that you like about, um, I don't have an accurate and educated number, uh, I would say majority of us are living in that state of survivalism. And hence, you don't believe you are worthy of being helped or people are not capable of helping you. And hence, and if you don't have a point of reference, meaning you haven't done that in life, You've never created that memory. You've never reached out and said, Mitra, can you please help me with this? I really need your help so that you can have that reference and say, oh, last time I was in this situation, I called Mitra and Mitra helped me. Uh, or, or I called my boyfriend or I called my friend and they helped me. So there's no point of reference. You are running emotionally, of course, energetically. And, and hence, add a little bit of ability, add a little bit of uh, 
you know, intelligence, added a little bit of education, all those things that you may have. And then, of course, you're not going to ask for help. So I'm going to stop and see how and if this is resonating um, with you and, and then continue. Tell me. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that obviously when you talk about survival mode, like I, I'm, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, I'm, I'm originally from Venezuela. So obviously for, for years, I was like in literal survival mode. Like I think uh, ever since I was like really young, like uh, things like buying food and like basic things were always like really hard. So obviously at first I was young and then when I started working, like a lot of that, uh, ended up falling uh, on my shoulders, like a lot of that responsibility. So for years, I, I feel like, I feel like I've, I've been like in literal survival mode for years. And then when I left my country, it's like some of those things stop at least for me because I, I left, but I still have family there that are like super important for me, obviously. And they're like my biggest responsibility. And sometimes uh, it's like, I have like these constant fears <laughs> that if I'm not be able to like help them, who else is gonna do it? And it's like, uh, I guess that's that, that also kind of like what makes it hard sometimes to ask for help because I feel like, I mean, for myself or taking care of me, I feel like it's easy, but like taking care of others feels like a lot of like too much to ask uh, from other people that have no reason, you know, to, to help with that. Like it's my family, it's my responsibility. So I don't know, I guess I have like this constant fear, like what if ha something were to happen to me or what if I wasn't able to like help, like who else is gonna do it? And I can't really like wrap my head around the idea that there is someone else out there, even though I have friends and people that I know that they care about me, I know it, but I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't see it like, uh, so I guess that, I guess my question is like how, how do you recognize that, that you have people in your life that actually care about you and that they would be willing to help you when for some reason it's like there's a voice in your head that tells you that no, that's not true. People have their own worries, their their own things, and and they they don't have the, the time or resources to help you, you know. So first of all, uh thank you for being vulnerable, Elisa. Secondly, I want to say that um I I hear your fear. And, and that is the sign of being in survival mode. But you're wanting uh, guarantees and signs that outwardly people will be there to help you. And, and I explain what I mean by that. So there is always two aspects to the way we experience life. One is inwardly and two is outwardly. So outwardly, I can tell you, oh, I have three friends I can count on. My brother is there, like my daughter is there. And th those are outwardly. And that's great. Of course, I need to have that because I'm a physical being. But then inwardly, there needs to be a sense of trust that the same way that the little Elisa was able to somehow become a grown up quickly and provide for her family and leave that country that was not serving her needs. And I assume find a job and uh, I don't know, are you, are you feeling comfortable professionally in your position where you are? Yeah, yeah, luckily I am, yeah. Okay, so you are feeling completely comfortable. Like if I logically asked you, do you have a fear? You would say no. But what is happening is that it is your state of inner being that is altering the way you show up. So this is very, very uh, dainty point that I want to bring out. If I am outwardly comfortable right now, but inwardly in fear, believe it or not, the opposite of that can be true too. I can be outwardly uncomfortable, but inwardly comfortable. Do you see what I'm saying? Because apparently your inner state, the way you're feeling is not really very directly connected to where you are in life. I can see your face, people can't. You are a young person. It's not like I'm talking about like I'm in my 60s, but you look like you're much, 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 much younger than me. So you have the youth, 
You have the capability, how do I know? Because you're successful as a professional that you are. And you have the health. So you have all those things, but yet you're feeling the fear because you think you should only count on, on the physical things that you can see. And I want to tell you that what, what I want to invite you is you've got to trust there is a bigger, larger, deeper, vaster aspect of you and all of us that always is available to us. And that's where I want you to count on. I was, uh, I had this thing about my kids as we were growing up and as I was uh, living as a immigrant, single mother with two kids and three jobs, uh, there would be a lot of issues, a lot of problems that would come up. And, and I told them and I told myself, we are a, a wayfinders. We are wayfinders. I'm a wayfinder, which means I will find a way. And I remember once, of course, my daughter, who was very <laughs> smart, she came to me and she said, mom, this happened and that happened. And she said, so you are a wayfinder. What are we going to do? I said, no, 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 no. I didn't say I have the answer. I said, I can find the answer. I can find the way. So what I really was doing both internally and externally communicating it to her is that I may not know. If you ask me a lot of things, I wouldn't know. But I trust that there is an aspect of me that can find the way. So I do not have resources if something happens to me for my family. is not a period. is a comma. Yet, comma, yet, I trust that they, I, will find the way. So it really is going to a belief system. That's what I'm talking about. That the question is, with what belief are you walking the streets of life every day? One belief is that there is dangers and I'm always unlucky and nothing good will happen. That's one extreme. The other extreme is, yeah, life has ups and downs, of course, very realistic. Yet I seem to find my way every time. So I'm going to go quiet and see how these words are landing for you, Elisa. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, it's funny. I that kind of resonates with me, and also like with my, I guess my the image I have of my mom as well. Like the whole idea of like finding a way. It's always that something that she always has done, and it's something also that I, I, I guess I, I got from her. Uh, there's always like you said, yeah, yes, we'll find a way. But like, I guess that, <laughs> that whenever I think of that, it's I do it from like this point of view of like I will find a way. Like I'm gonna do it. I will have to do it. Um, and I I guess that what you were talking about, like trusting that there's like something bigger or something else. It's it's still kind of hard, you know. Sorry, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a bit emotional. Obviously, talking about these things makes me real emotional. Um, I guess that uh, the other question I, I I guess I have now that you were talking about belief is like how how do you like because the thing I have when I ask for help or when I talk about whatever that's going on with me I have like this I guess fear again <laughs> that I I I don't want people to like feel sorry. For me, I feel like when if I ask for help, people may might feel sorry for me or might feel sad for me, and that's something that uh, when I was really young, like uh, my dad passed away when I was like seven, and back then when that happened, I felt like people treated me differently automatically when that happened, and I didn't like the feeling of that. And later on, like I like I mentioned at the beginning, my boyfriend, who is not my boyfriend anymore, like when we broke up. I felt like people were going, like, I didn't want to ask for help during that time because I felt like, oh, they're going to treat me differently now because I'm, I'm like the girl that broke up with her boyfriend or whatever. So it's like, I've noticed like this, this like aversion to the idea of people feeling sorry for me or, or like having people beating me or, or that. So I guess my question is like, how, how do you let go of that, basically that belief that is so like, 
in your core that that's going to happen if you ask for help or whatever like how do you change that or how do you let go of that and like make room for trusting that people won't won't do that won't, won't treat you like that sure so uh you don't let it go you replace it with the healthier uh belief because it's interesting you just said when that belief was formed basically you were seven I assume you're much older now, <laughs> as young as you are, you're much, much older than that. So you really need to examine these beliefs. We all need to examine our beliefs because some of them, many of them, uh, some may say all of them were formed when we were far less capable, both physically, mentally, and energetically. So I had a belief I was twice as old as you were when my father died. I was 14, actually. So I had certain beliefs that were formed when I was 14. You were half my age. So you don't you think it's about time that we examine those? So that's one number. The number two thing I want to say about that is that when we examine them, we take into consideration the facts of life. I mean, if I told you, If I arrived and told you, say I was your teacher or mentor, or you worked with me professionally every week, like some clients do. If I told you, you know, Alicia, I have a wonderful life. I have no problems whatsoever. I'm strong on top of it. Whatever comes around, I just solve it on my own. I never need help. And I just seem to know everything. You probably will say either she is exaggerating Or if it is true, I don't want to work with someone who has no human experience. I mean, if you look at the, like these successful speakers, uh, so-called motivational speakers, they all tell you their story of doom and then tell you what they did. In fact, if they came and said, I was successful and I came from a very good family and everything was provided for me and here I am, I have a successful family, everyone says, oh, big deal. Tell me a story that I can relate to like a human being. So you really need to re-examine that belief, taking into consideration what you didn't know when you were seven and what you do know as a person who has gone through a lot of changes, has changed countries, has fallen in love and out of love or has to, had to leave her love, so had to take care of her uh, family. So this is a different Elisa. Then a seven-year-old, oh, I'm so sorry, come here, I'll hold you. If the belief hasn't changed, then there is something that needs to be looked at. So my invitation to you, and I'll, and I'll give you the how, actually, of, of how to work with, with identification of needs. But before that, because really behind everything we do, I say before, behind every A, there's a B. Behind in every action, there is a belief. And if we do not examine that belief, then the action and the changes will not be sustainable. So you said, I have an aversion to that because as a seven-year-old, when somebody says, oh, you poor Elisa, nobody likes it. At seven, I want to be better than my friend. I don't know about life. I just want to have the bigger toy and have the best, you know, grade at school or best something. I'm, I'm, I'm seven. But at this age, in my 20s, in my 30s, in my 40s, in my case, in my 60s, I have a completely different view of life. I'm far more um, practical. I have a wider picture of life. And more importantly, I have the experience that says to me, a good life, a strong person is not a person who's never felt down and never felt they needed help. A true human being is a person who needed it and received it or not, and yet moved on. That's what I will be really seeing and looking up to, as opposed to as a person that never fell. I always say to parents, you want to teach your children, you want to prevent your children from falling. What you need to do is to teach them how to get up when they fall, because fall they will because they're human being and alive, unless you put them in a room and never let them go out. Of course they're going to fall. Every moment that you get out of your home, every moment that you go on Zoom and work with others, you're risking something. 
What if you don't say the right thing? What if you don't do a good job? What if you don't drive well? What if you don't speak to people? Well, that you cannot prevent. What you can do when that happens is to be prepared and say, you know what? I know what to do. I know who to ask. And if they say no, that's fine. I move forward. You don't need protection, Elisa. You need experience and point of reference of how to work with asking for help and if not receiving it, yet being okay with it. I'm going to go quiet and ask you to talk. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's funny that you mentioned it because I guess I, I never really looked at it like, yeah, I mean, that's a belief that I have since I was like, a little girl so it's it's funny because now that I think about it it's like yeah well of course like it's if we're seven like that's the reaction you have and obviously like you don't like it or, or whatever but um yeah I guess I never really thought about like it's it's very different like to feel sorry for for like a girl because obviously like she's she's young and, and what happened to her isn't is easy but like you know I guess when when you're older like I guess people won't necessarily treat you like that and I guess that also it's like I like I mentioned like I know like I have people around me that care about me and that, that can help me and it's very different to ask for help from that kind of people that you know actually mean it than asking I guess like as your teacher that just treated you like oh poor thing because I guess that's how they feel they they had to react at that at that moment so, yeah, I, I guess I, I, ha I hadn't really looked at it that, that way. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad to see that you are showing some emotions. People can't see it, but it's it just lovely to see your emotions. But I want to say that instead of feeling sorry for that little girl, you need to really bring compassion to that little girl. There's a huge difference. Sorry means, oh, you poor thing. Compassion means I feel you. I hold the space for you. I accommodate and, and celebrate your emotions. And, and I think somehow there's another belief behind that belief that being vulnerable and having needs or asking, there's something wrong with that. Like, not good people, not smart people, not strong people, something is associated with that belief. Do not ask for help. And I want to say that, um, honestly, um, unexamined beliefs bring that kind of action. I'm hoping that when you need help, you seek it, you ask for it, and, and you also have the capacity to hold any answer that, that you may receive because you may ask me for help when I am in a place that I can't help. You know, I'm running myself and you're saying, Misha, can you carry these bags? And I'm saying, no, I already have five bags. I'm sorry. And you need to have capacity for that too. I keep saying that because that's one of the reasons that people don't ask and seek help. They tell me, oh, I did, but nobody helped. And I say, that's okay. That's okay. We need to have capacity for that too. Doesn't mean just because the five people were not able to give it, you shouldn't ask. This is not about them. This is really about you and your um, expansion of capacity to hold a few things here. One is to recognize that as a human being, as a healthy, balanced human being, you have needs that sometimes requires the help of others. One, two, others may not always be in a place to provide that. And you need to hold that too and not stop it. You just say, okay, Mitra is not available. Let me ask, you know, my other friend. Let me ask, you know, this neighbor. Let me ask that colleague. And the more, it's like a practice. The more you ask, the better you get at it, both in asking and recognizing where and how to ask, which is, what I want to go, I, I'm going to stop and see if, if this is serving you. Is this good for you? Yeah, yeah. And now that you were mentioning that, I guess that in a way, I always assume that if I ask for help, people are going to be like, like you said, like they're running too. I always assume that that's the case. So that's why I don't even do it. So yeah, it's, 
it's 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 weird because I always assume that, so that's why I don't ask. But I guess that there is always like the possibility that there is people that can help, and I don't even ask them because I, I assume that. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> yeah, and you don't need to assume that. You can actually ask. Sometimes when mm-hmm. I call a friend or, or I call my partner, and I have something heavy to share or ask, I always say, um, "Is this a good time? Do you have capacity?" It's a beautiful mm-hmm. statement. And they say, "What well, for what? And I say, well, mm. I need to share something heavy or I need to ask for a favor. And before I do that, and I give them time and I said, you know, you, you can let me know later today. I just I was asking because this evening would be a good time for me if it is for you. So you ask for their capacity because you it, it goes back to the belief. You understand life. You understand that sometimes, you know, uh, my teacher used to say, you don't know who just lost their dog. You don't know who is parents are sick. You don't know whose lover just left them. You just don't know. And you assume just because I'm dressed up and I'm at work or I'm on the street or I'm in a party, I'm in a fantastic place. No, I may be carrying things like you are that you can't see. So ask, but also respect, you know, Mm -hmm. the fact that I may not be able to do it. And that's got nothing to do with you. It's got to do, and you shouldn't stop on the basis of that. It's got to do with the fact that I too am a human being. I too carry a lot of load. I too may be worried about my family. I too am responsible to take care of my family, whether it's you know first family or second family or other families that I'm responsible for. So you really are looking at a much bigger version of human being as opposed to a limited version that it's a yes or no. Am I strong or not? Do I ask or not? And what if they they say no? What if they say no? Nothing. The same way you Mm. needed some help, they may need some help. So really bringing a language to it. So let me go, because I'm aware of the time. Um, If you don't mind, I'll go to some tools. Is that a good time? Is that okay? Okay. So the first step that I want to take you to is really for you to get into the recognition and awareness of when you need because you're not savvy with that you have no experience of that so one um, practice which is very helpful if you just throughout the day whenever you remember i usually say breakfast lunch and dinner because you can associate it when you when you sit down to eat breakfast or lunch or dinner or all of them you ask yourself what am i feeling and what am i needing right now and then it could be just very simple. Um, I, I need a bit of rest. I need a bit of, what do I need right now? And when you do that, you are really becoming fluent in the language of self-need. What are my needs? And you will begin with nothing. I bet you you're going to say nothing. And then you you go to simple things. Um, I'm thirsty. I need water, like at the physical level. Or you may go to psychological aspect and say, well, I, I need some someone to talk to. You know, I really need to that. And then you may go deeper and say, I need a different vision and view of life. I need to go to the bigger aspect of my mind. Something like beyond that. But it doesn't matter what it is. Wherever you meet yourself, wherever you identify your needs is a good place. Why? Because you're becoming savvy and, and fluent with need identification. So the step one is awareness of your needs. And whenever in that process, you realize that you need help with that need. So say I I need something even physical. I need water, but I don't have the time to go and purchase water, for instance. I've run out of water. Something very simple. I, I can think about, oh, you know, Elisa is coming here to visit. Maybe I can ask her to get some water for me on the way if, if she can. If she can. And that's a huge if. So... The first step is awareness and identification. The second aspect is really, um, actually before that, acceptance of it. Acceptance that I have needs, nature has needs, other people have needs. The third aspect is asking. So awareness, acceptance, ask. So you start practicing asking. Start small. Misha, on your way, could you please pick a bottle of water for me? because you're, you're doing the alphabet of asking. You can't go with, can you send me you know, $10,000? You start with you know, bottle of water. Then you say, you know, um, could you 
and asking, can, it doesn't need to be always a thing. Can you give me 10 more minutes to get ready because I need some time? That's another ask, you know, expressing instead of like really putting pressure on yourself and really getting out of whack because we can't make it on time. Like we had an appointment for this session and you really say you couldn't make it. And then you can ask and, and, and write to me and say, I will be 10 minutes late, please give me. So you have given yourself permission to do that. So these are the three steps, the three A's, if you like, of, of um, uh, asking for help. One is awareness of your needs and practice of that. Two, belief that comes with that acceptance of that, accepting that I have needs, you have needs. Sometimes I can, sometimes you can, sometimes we neither of us can. And the third one is asking, practice asking, start small and graduate yourself to bigger things that you can call your friends and, and ask for, you know, Mitra, I need you to give me one hour of your time tonight. Do you have the capacity? I really want to share something heavy with you. Okay, I'm going to stop and see how you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's funny because I, I, you would think that the last step they ask you is the part that's hardest, but I think it's actually the second step, the acceptance one. Now that you were saying it, it's like, I think that's where I get stuck because I may be able to recognize that I need help, but instead of accepting it, I, I need to think like, no, you, sh you should be able to, to handle Putting this yourself. yourself. <laughs> yeah, you should you should be able to do it. You should be able to handle it. You should everyone deals with things. You should be able to deal with things too. And that's where I get stuck. And yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would think that the last one, because that's I mean the the whole idea behind this session was to like how do I ask for help? But I guess my actual struggle is with the idea of accepting that I may need help with things sometimes in life. Yes. And that's very insightful, by the way, Alisa. That's very insightful because uh, every single one of us may have problems with it, but we may get stuck on a different step. I may not even know the awareness might be the problem. I may not be even aware that I need help. You said that your acceptance of your need is a struggle for you. Mm -hmm. And somebody may say, there is no way I can ask people. So it's very insightful. And I invite people who are listening to this session to really ask yourself, if this is your challenge, ask yourself on which step, awareness, acceptance, or asking, where, where is my struggle or my most struggle? And that's the practice that you need to do more. And, mm. and really understanding the story of human beings that we, first of all, all are incomplete and hence need assistance. And two, we are all interconnected. We are this different cells of the same body of life. So we were meant to be asking for help. We were designed to be asking for help, except we forgot or we misused it or we never used it or maybe we abused it. And this is a great time to learn how in a healthy way we can use our interconnectedness and receive and give assistance and help. Okay. How, yeah. how did we do, Alisa? Tell me if this served you, if you have something to take away. Yeah, I think that all of these, it's like, <sighs> It's funny because it's things that you would think, oh, they're, they're obvious, but like I, I haven't, I hadn't seen it that way, or I hadn't looked at them like, oh, I, I guess that this is where I, I'm actually struggling, or that sort of thing. So, yeah, this gives me like a lot to think about, and and, and like, like I mentioned, I'm also like working through therapy, so I, I, I guess in a, in a way, it's interesting how, like, yeah, like you mentioned at the beginning, it's like there's all these psychological things, but like, I guess it's it's interesting to look at it from, from a different point of view and, and, and see like, yeah, I, I have problems accepting this. How can I, how can I work on that? And, and I don't know, it's, it's, it's a lot to think about. And I think that, yeah, I can try to, to, to find a way. Yeah. To find a way, like we said at the beginning, I can try to find a way through this step yes. and, and see how that goes. Great. It sounds like you are a wayfinder because of the history you gave us, that you come 
from a very um, uh, politically difficult place. You yeah. dealt with that. Uh, you found your way. Uh, you seem to be a professional that has a job and is capable and is helping your family. So it seems like you are a way founder, <laughs> a way yeah. finder. And, and I think you need to really reference that and, and practice acceptance of the fact that, uh, you know, that's the story of human beings and we are supposed to fall and we're mm -hmm. supposed to find ways and we're supposed to ask for help when it's appropriate and when it's mm -hmm. time. So, yeah, that was a great session. Thank you for trusting me with, with your life story and your questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you have anything else to say before we say goodbye? No, I think that's it. I mean, thank you, like, for giving me, like, your this moment of your time, too, and, and to talk. And I guess, in a way, this, this was me asking her for help. So <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a good practice. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great practice. And, and as you saw, and let, let this be a point of reference, it was a pleasure and honor to mm -hmm. to assist where I could and and that would be a good point of reference for you so I thank you for your vulnerability because I can see that's a bit of a struggle because I can see your face to share and ask and I think you're very courageous that you have done Hope this episode answered the question or two for you or provoked and inspired questions in you. I'm so grateful you showed up and listened up. Until the next time, be well and stay curious. <laughs>